All right, this is OpenStax US History, Chapter 23, Section 2, The United States Prepares for War. So recall we are talking about World War One from 1914 to 1919. And in 1917, US entry, right? That's when the United States declares war against Germany and the Central Powers. Now the war itself had become a war of attrition. This was true before 1917. A war of attrition is a war in which each side attempts to starve out the enemy. So at that point of the war, due to the technology, barbed wire, artillery, poison gas, machine guns, neither side was really trying to win the war. They were simply trying to not lose the war. They were trying to bleed the other side out. Uh, and that's essentially what the war had become in Europe. And so big for this war is less about the kind of battle plans and tactics and strategies, and more, were, uh, more importance was put on things like supplies. Uh, and materials. And one of the great advantages for the US was that it was a major industrial country. Like we talked about during the Gilded Age, the United States became one of the world's leading economic powers. And that position the US had in terms of being able to produce the, the materials required really put it in a good position. Um, in 1917, the United States passed the Selective Service Act. This was the military draft. We also might call this conscription. This required that, you know, certain men of military age uh, be conscripted into the military. This was not by choice. You had some people who ended up fleeing the United States, so they didn't have to serve. So this was, again, conscription forced service in the military. In order to ensure that there were enough supplies, a fuel and food administration were created. So this was created to ration materials, in this case, food and fuel for the war. So you can see uh, from these uh, propaganda uh, posters, right? Uh, sign your country's pledge to save food. That means make sure there's enough food for the military to eat first, and then you at home eat second. Here you can see food will win the war. And so these were different ways that uh, Americans back home could participate in the war effort. Daylight saving time was created by the fuel, or fuel or food administrations, one of these administrations, to produce more for the war. All right, that is setting your clock back or ahead. Herbert Hoover, later on a future president, he was actually ahead of the Food Administration. And it was actually, uh, because he handled it so well that he eventually made his way to the presidency. This was one of his uh, kind of, um, you know, this was one of his accomplishments that he could use to win the presidency later on. The War Industries Board uh, really organized and coordinated business to produce war materials. Right, you got to think about well, the US economy when the war broke out was a laissez faire capitalist economy where businesses could pretty much produce whatever they wanted whenever they wanted. The War Industries Board was set up by the government in order to make sure that the right supplies were being made for the war effort. So this was businesses and governments cooperating with cooperating with each other to raise money. Liberty bonds were passed. So this was a way of raising money, right? If you're not familiar, a bond is a piece of paper, right? This might be the bond. You have on the one hand, the US government, which sells the bond, and then you have citizens. And what citizens do is citizens give the government money, the government gives citizens a bond. So we'll draw maybe a green dollar sign. Now, of course, the government can then use the green dollars, right, that they get from the citizens for the war. And what a bond actually is, is essentially an IOU, 
right? You know, maybe five years or something like that. So this was a way primarily of raising money. So citizens would buy bonds, they would get a piece of paper, uh, the government would get their money, they could fight the war with it. And, you know, that bond stated that in five years, that person would get their money back plus some. So it was kind of like an investment. Bonds were the primary way in which countries funded the war effort in the First World War. It was kind of like a way to, um, <coughs> excuse me, it was like a way to uh, bet on your side, right? You were betting on your own country. And so with all these measures, the United States had the men, it had the money, it had the food, it had the fuel, it had the supplies. It had all the materials that were needed to fight the war. But that's only one part of the equation. The other part of the equation is, um, you know, you need all the, the money and the men and the weapons and all that too, but you also need public opinion. Americans need to believe in the cause and part of controlling public opinion is controlling dissent. And dissent, of course, are people who disagree with the war effort, and probably more so uh, effort, and probably more so than any other conflict, you had a large number of people who didn't agree with America's involvement in World War I. It wasn't a war where the United States was attacked outright like World War II. You had a lot of different ethnic groups like Germans and Irish and Jews who you know sided with the Central Powers. A lot of immigrants actually came to the United States because they didn't want to serve in the military. So there was a good number of people who, um, you know, were dissenters who didn't agree. And this was especially true when you had something like the military draft. You know, it's one thing to um, vote for a war, to support a war. It's another thing to be drafted into the war. So the Committee of Public Information was created as essentially a propaganda office to spread information about supporting the war. You can see this is a depiction of Germany here. And of course, one part of propaganda is to really make your en enemies look bad, right? That's one, one part of it. George Creel was the head of it, so he led this. And this was the first federal propaganda office really in the United States history. Uh, some of this effort led to anti-German sentiments, including the banning of certain German language books, um, a lot of German immigrants themselves changed their names to try to blend in. Hamburgers were called Liberty Sandwiches. You know, so you did have somewhat of a backlash against the German population. However, laws were a little bit more strict. The Espionage Act made it illegal to aid the enemy. And the Sedition Act made it illegal. Of course, both these are illegal. Any sort of um, speech that hinders the war effort, right? All right, so aiding the enemy and any speech that hinders the war effort, these things were both made illegal. Now, obvious, well, maybe not obviously, but the Sedition Act in particular was a problem for many because this is clearly a violation of the first Amendment, and of course, this will be a you know this is a debate regarding free speech that comes up often in American history. Uh, one of the individuals who was arrested under the Espionage Act was Eugene V. Debs, and this was the most common way of violating both either the Espionage Act or the Sedition Act, and that was to tell people to boycott the draft. Right, that was the most common way of violating this, to tell people to boycott the draft, hand out pamphlets or newspapers or whatever it was. Eugene Debs, who was the leader of the Pullman strike, a socialist candidate for the United States presidency, uh, was put in jail for 10 years for violating this, telling people to, to boycott the draft. You know, I think around 2,000 people were eventually arrested under both of these laws. But of course, the purpose of them is to aid the war effort to make sure that there's no dissenting opinion and the American war effort remains strong. Uh, and uh, also, neighborhoods created councils of defense. So these might be uh, neighborhood kind of uh, watch groups maybe to watch out for any sort of dissenting opinion. Uh, however, these laws, the Espionage and Sedition Act, were challenged by the Supreme Court 
in the case Schneck versus the United States. And in that case, the Supreme Court ruled that um, the Espionage Act and the Sedition Act were constitutional, right? So the Espionage and Sedition Acts are constitutional and that there is limits on free speech. And the limit that was ruled on free speech in this court case way back in 1919 is still the limit on free speech that we, we have today, essentially. And that is free speech can be limited by the government when there is a clear and present danger. In this case, the clear and present danger is World War I. It is Germany who the United States is fighting. But the example that was given at this case was yelling fire, right? in a crowded theater. Uh, eventually the Sedition Act and the um, Espionage Act did expire. So after the war was over, it you know they were gone. Uh, but this court case did defend those as constitutional and did in fact rule that there are limits on freedom of speech.